lingering cold over the last week. So I apologize if there's a little bit of coughing, a little bit here and there. I think I'm mostly over it, but um, no worries. All right. All right. Welcome. Thursday, March 11th, this time on video with James Long, uh, who's going to talk to us about building his uh, actual budget app uh, as a completely local app with some dark magic of CRDTs and SQL Lite uh, and other uh, such things. Not a lot of people have uh, put together stacks like this. Uh, Fission is working on making some of this stuff much more accessible and available to all developers. But we're really excited to hear from James um, and have him tell us how, what how he put stuff together. Um, and uh, I'll hand it over to James and let you take it away. Great, thank you very much. Hey, I'm James. Um, I will share my screen. I ended up writing a bunch of keynote slides. Um, if I'm allowed to share my screen, I'm assuming. Yeah. Cool. All right. Hide the controls. Um, all right, so forgot to fill out the subtitle. Uh, building actual something, something, something. Um, I don't know what to say there. I don't know. It's a cool app. You should try it out. Uh, it has some cool tech in it. Um, it's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I have a confession to make. I am. Uh, I'm just here for the features. You know, I I love privacy. I think users have a right to privacy. Uh, but I, I'm not on a mission to change the world and make a big impact in the privacy space, right? That's, that's, that's not why I'm doing this. Um, I'm here to build a product. And so uh, what motivates me to go down this path um, is the features that it provides. Um, and, you know, I think that's a good thing because uh, privacy is actually not something that is a super strong selling point to, feed, to, to people. I think we should be here for the features and we need to sell the features as a way to also provide an avenue to go into this more privacy-focused uh, world. And it's strange that people don't value privacy, right? If somebody was standing outside your window and looking at you, what you're doing, you know, you would think all, like, I think everybody would feel violated of that and feel weirded out. Uh, but why don't they feel the same about the internet? It's kind of weird. Um, even though on the internet, people can probably watch them more intimately there than they would if they were just standing outside your window. So there is a strange disconnect there. For me, why aren't people weirded out about how tracked they are on the internet and how much they share data with all, all these other companies? So I do value privacy, um, but you know it cannot be the reason why people switch. Um, and so um, you know, Actual is, is a product where um, I kind of only go 80% of the way in terms of this whole world of privacy and like peer-to-peer -peer apps and um, distributed apps and things like that. Uh, I really only go 80% of the way because I'm here for the features. And it turns out that you can do most of this and get a lot of the features there. Um, but there are things that I do that would not be considered a true, you know, fully decentralized peer to peer privacy focused app. So I kind of cheat because if you cheat, you'll win. It's not, it's, this is not a peer to peer app. This is, there's not decentralized auth. There is a centralized server that uses the standardized centralized auth because I'm not here to build this entire product. I'm banking on smarter people than me, like Fission, to actually build this, these new platforms which need to be built, which is a whole lot of work. I'm not here to do that, I'm here to build a product. Um, so I'm kind of, there's things that I do that is sort of a, fills in that gap that just like is the standard way to do things. Um, but hopefully in the future, it would be amazing if there was some sort of platform that solves these more fundamental problems that, you know, my kind of app could switch to and be built on. Um, so, you know, even my CRDTs are relatively simple. I don't use uh, complex CRDTs that actually enforce correctness at the data level layer, which is pretty complex, right? If you have like a tree data structure, um, there is like Incan Switch and Martin Kleppman and all of those people are working on like really uh, interesting ways to model data such that uh, it's always valid, right? In the CRDT, like, it is a CRDT, so it's syncable, uh, but there's no way for it to get into an invalid state. That's really interesting. It's also really complex. I don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. My things are pretty simple. And it turns out that if I slap on some runtime validation logic, it works out in practice all right, at least for my app. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of other things that I'll go through throughout this talk that I will say, you know, if I was a true app, 
a pure app that did this all the way. It'd be super complex, uh, but I actually kind of cheat by doing this other thing. Um, so in, in a way, the way that I like to think about it is that it's vertically integrated, right? My whole syncing layer and everything in the app is very tightly integrated with actual, I mean, other people could probably take my syncing layer and sort of use it, but like the performance characteristics, what it does and the features are very fine tuned for my use cases that I know I have, which is a, a personal finance app with a small amount of data. And, you know, it's just, it's not generalizable. However, I think this is, it's a great way to prove out that these things are possible and just see what it looks like to even write these kind of apps and like what, you know, what are the performance characteristics? What, what does it feel like to use an app like this without having to go all the way and have, you know, generalizable CRDTs that work in these other crazy complex cases. So from my opinion, it's still a fun kind of, um, I can blaze the path a little bit faster by cheating um, and showing like selling people on these type of apps. And then hopefully the, the bigger problems can be solved by platforms like Vision and other things. And we can hopefully, you know, all go into a new world of apps. Um, so what is actual? Uh, Quick tagline is it's kind of an app for personal finance nerds. Um, the demographic uh, targeted is people who probably use a spreadsheet at one point and just got so tired of just like dealing with transactions in a spreadsheet because it really is not, it's really just annoying. Um, if you're using a spreadsheet for like continually adding transactions, it's a database, like a SQLite database. It's just like the perfect place for just like a small amount of your transaction data that you're adding trans a couple of transactions every couple of days. Uh, and then you can do like select some amount from transactions and that's your balance, right? Doing that in a spreadsheet, it's fine, but it's super annoying. And you don't really wanna be sitting there in front of a spreadsheet all, all day. So it's sort of personal finance nerds who just want something better and quicker, it's where you don't really wanna sit in front of a spreadsheet all day. Um, it's closed source, it's a $4 a month subscription, the price might be tweaked. Um, again, this is sort of like the cheating um, aspect. Sustainability is a big problem with like, open source apps, decentralized apps. It's a huge discussion there about how to make it sustainable, right? I'm not gonna tackle that problem. I'm focusing on building a product. It's gonna be closed source as you have to pay for it. Um, I mean, that's, and there, there are some interesting things because my tech is the way it is. Um, there are some interesting things that I can do. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that later on. There's one idea I have that could actually kind of go against this a little bit, but generally speaking, um, it's really, it's a whole, it's very hard to open source an app, make it profitable. You know, that's obviously like a big discussion there. For me, I think that I'm providing value for users, totally justified for me that I have no problem with it being closed source and provide value to users. Um, but yeah, there's more I'll talk about this later. Um, so a quick history, um, this was actual, what well, this wasn't actual, I called it influx at the time. Uh, this was 2013, this is when I like, um, started building something. Honestly, I started building it because I had no idea how to manage finances. And so the best way for me to learn is to build something. Cause it just, it forces you to think through, you know, everything, like how to structure the data. Um, what, are, what are the workflows that the user um, uses for some reason, existing apps just weren't clicking with me. Um, and maybe I just didn't find the right tutorial or something. Uh, but this was like, obviously I was horrible at design, horrible at product. I mean, not just horrible, literally just like, there's no design or product sense here. Um, but this is when I just like started tinkering with this idea. Fast forward four years, you know, I was kind of just like learning how to manage money. Um, so four years later, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take another crack at this. Uh, so uh, let's see, I need to move this. Um, and so I built um, another style app. Uh, here I have a mobile app and a desktop app. Um, so you can see in, in the desktop app, I had this idea of like, you have only spreadsheets and only tables. It's like this this pure app where there's only two concepts. Uh, so I kind of like spreadsheets, but I want the the my financial data to be in a SQLite um, tables because it's just like, it's so much easier to, um, to use. So the idea was like, it's a very generic app where you could sort of build these like spreadsheets built on top of this database. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible idea, terrible idea. Cause like, there's a point to which you go so generic that like, you're not really building anything. I mean, or you're just rebuilding the spreadsheet. And it's just like, I just, just go use a spreadsheet and use an API to insert the data into the spreadsheet there. Um, but you can see that there is some form of like, I still like this local app idea, 
Um, and I, I knew like a mobile app was important because like you're on the go a lot and you want to be viewing your finances as a mobile app. Um, fa uh, fast. So this was the same year in 2017. So this was the first time that I got data syncing across the apps, right? Because this is when I started realizing like, wow, this is actually, uh, I actually, the problem with local apps is that like, all of your data is local, which is great. But one, if you drop your computer in the ocean, one, all your data is gone. I mean that, and it's just, people don't expect that anymore. We are, we live in this modern age where you, like a local app with literally just one like SQLite file on your computer, um, that's not gonna fly with, I, I'm not gonna sell it to people. People are gonna be like, what the heck? Why can't I just like go to my partner's computer, sign in, just like see my data. This is dumb. I'm gonna move on to another app. Um, so the end also people were saying that like, I really want to, um, a mobile app because I obviously I'm going to be out and I want to like check my groceries budget as I'm doing my groceries. And so uh, it's just like, what am I going to do here? So uh, I still had no, no, no product sense here, no design sense. Uh, honestly, I was kind of interested in this uh, it's more in the, in the tech of it. It's just like, I wasn't actually building a product here. I wasn't actually planning to launch this. Um, this is my own, like my own intellectual curiosity, as well as like forcing myself to kind of learn how to budget and manage money um, through building an app. But this is the first time that I seen something. So if you look closely, you can see that that the that the numbers are all the same, right? The first transaction has forty one dollars and twenty two cents. So I was like, this is awesome. Like, uh, it's just like really fun to build. Um, turns I had turns out I had no idea what I was getting into here. This is actually like a horrible, horrible sinking strategy. It was like. A, a hacked up version turned like I didn't know this at the time. It was sort of like a hacked up version of like operational transforms. Um, I I did it myself. I literally did no research. I was just like, oh, you know, I think this could work. You know, like you kind of re like rebase changes on top of each other, and I can't see why that wouldn't work. Um, a couple months after this, I think I wrote like a property test, and I was like, well, wow, like this doesn't work in seventy percent of use cases. Um, but it was cool to see it working. Uh, fast forward a couple, a couple months later, started working on, on the design of the app. Um, so this was forcing me to learn design skills. I kept trying to find a designer, couldn't, couldn't find anybody who wanted um, to help out. So I was just like, you know what, I, I need to learn design. Um, I actually like design. Um, so the design started happening here. It's still pretty ugly, still pretty bad, still pretty bare bones. Uh, but it's kind of interesting, right? Like you can sort of see how, how it's coming along if you compare it to now. Um, and so this is now 2021 what I think is a relatively pleasant app might not be, um, as good as a, if I had like a real designer. Um, but the, I think the, the most important part here is like the user experience of it. So I will show you in just a few minutes about really it's the, the UX and, and the, and the interaction of it, I think is, 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 um, the really cool part about it more than just the visual design here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is where we are today. And now we have a, um, a mobile app, uh, a desktop app, and a web version. And they all still have the local SQLite file. So it's still true to that uh, premise. And uh, and it just all syncs together uh, very well. Um, and so, so far, the way that I've been uh, sort of thinking about this is that I'm investing in the foundation. So for the first stage of those like several years, I was just learning how to manage money. And it was just purely my own, like, I want to learn myself and force myself how to think about money. And, um, and I just want to like force myself to learn this new, like this new thing called React, right? That was around 2015. So until 2017, React was still relatively new. Um, like, like a lot of my, I wrote a lot of blog posts between like 2017, 2020. A lot of those came from just building this kind of stuff. I, I actually really enjoy building products and and having um, solving these problems uh, in a product um, context where it's like these are the real problems. Not to say, you know, doing research that are not not attached to product it that's totally fine and i absolutely value that research but for me personally i really enjoy taking taking research from other people and putting it into a product context um so so far i i feel like even though the product right now has come really far and it has a lot of really good powerful features um i still view it as sort of this early phase where so far i've been investing in the foundations and really it wasn't until late last year where i felt like this foundation is pretty solid and it actually works and it actually is like it's super, super cool. Like this could actually be a good product. And that's why I actually ended up launching it two years ago was because I started getting this like glimpse of what it could be. Um, and I was like, you know, I really want to launch something. And so I ended up polish, like 
polishing it up. And I, I, I did the CRDT version and that was really what blew my mind. And then that, you know, I've launched, launched two years ago, just to launch early, even though it was terrible then, got some users, got some feedback. Um, it's been a very slow growth, to be honest. I have 280 paying users right now, which is, that's great. Um, for the time I've spent doing this, this is probably not the best like return on investment. There have been other products um, that have launched that have, you know, grown faster. Um, but for me, I still, I still feel like that, uh, I'm, you know, I just think of this on like a 10 year time span. It doesn't really, I don't really care if other people have grown faster. The, the, the thing that I'm building here is so unlike anything else on the market that I will be able to do things that they cannot do, um, in the next couple of years now that I have this solid foundation. Um, so just a quick demo, just to like actually give this some context, let me get out of Where's, where's my cursor? All right, there you go. Um, so here's, here's a quick demo. Uh, all of these numbers are, this is just a test, a test budget. Uh, let's see. Um, so this is the app. This is the budget screen transactions. Um, this is actually the development mode as well. So the, the, it's actually a little bit slower, um, but I can go in here. I can change this to a thousand. I can zero out all of these values. And if I just focus this other app over here, you'll see that it syncs up and the numbers are exactly the same. Uh, I can do, um, I can add a note here. Um, and you know, it syncs after like half a second after you make a change, come back here, it'll sync. And now that note is there. Um, and let's do something crazy. Let's do, um, add some more budget values here and then delete this entire category group. So if you delete a category group, you have to transfer your existing, like this is uh, right now it implements zero-based budgeting methodology. I'm not going to go into it, but you essentially have to like transfer you know, all of the transactions that have categorized to these categories right now. You got to transfer it over to, to a new category just so that everything still makes sense. Um, so I'm going to transfer this over to, to sell um, and I'm going to delete all these categories. So it transferred over the previous budget values into sell, deleted that category group, updated my two budget amount. Like it basically all these little changes propagated throughout the app. And now if I go back over here, you'll see that it immediately just does all that, right? So it's exactly the same. Um, now what's really cool is I can come into this app and I can just press command Z and just like undo all that work. And then, you know, let it sync, come back over here and boom, it's exactly the same. Uh, so I can move forward in time and I can move backward in time. Uh, and like, it's just amazing, right? I mean, uh, apps do try to implement undo, um, these days, but like, it just, you can tell that it's built on like a bandaid. You can tell that it's built on, like, they track the changes locally in the client. And then they like tell the server, you know, to like, uh, undo this delete category group. And then the server I'm sure has this entire custom workflow for like the undeleting this category group. You can tell it's just because like, it just breaks in these weird ways. Um, this literally just like reverses the CRDT and it's like, I mean, it's, it's so cool. Um, anyway, uh, let's see, was there another, I think, yeah. So in the transaction screen, you know, I can come in here and select transactions, delete those transactions and here, uh, I don't think it actually got synced yet. So all the transactions are deleted. There's some complex features like, like rules and stuff like this. So I can edit these rules. Um, and all of this stuff just like syncs perfectly. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the, that's the very quick demo. There's a mobile and web app as well that also sync all, all of this data is round, um, around as well. Um, and if you, if you want to, if you have any like quick questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them now. I would like, I, I would like to leave the, the deeper questions till the end, but feel free to interrupt me if you have like a super quick question or comment. So you, you don't want a quick question around how does CRTDs, CRDDs work? That's fine because I can actually see I'm about to go into that. So <laughs> amazing. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a quick question or drop it in chat and we can also read it out. Um, I was just wondering about the um, networking. Do you have the, like, how, how does the mobile app see the desktop app and, and vice versa? Yeah, so I, I'm about to go into all that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, so there, there's also a question from Philip. Uh, are undos per app? Uh, what would undo do in the right app if you made changes in the left app? 
undos are only right now undos uh are just they they do exist locally in the client um not in the client state in the back end state but they do only exist for that client um because undo is an is an extremely interesting problem like it's easy for me to apply the undo but it's actually very difficult to make undo a proper user experience like if you because like internally it might have to tweak four places in the database right but when you undo, it should undo all those four things in one transaction, right? You shouldn't undo four times. Um, so even though other clients theoretically, I could say, could theoretically reverse the CRDT messages, the other clients don't know at what point to go back in time to. So for, for now, the undo, um, but there's a feature that I will show at the end, which uh, actually could, is sort of solves that problem. If, you, if, a, if another client wanted to go back in time, I have a demo um, about how to do that, but the but the the native level like command Z undo is only per client. Um, and yeah, for some reason Keynote won't show me my cursor when I full screen, so I don't I can't see the chats. So yeah, feel free to uh, uh, James. What uh, there is a play, play in window option that theoretically you can do. Cool. Um, that may help. Play in window. Uh, not in this version. Never mind. Awesome. That's okay. <laughs> we can figure it out. Um, there's also some fighting between Zoom and uh, Keynote, but it's fine. So, how does it work? Um, so, I'll start out with SQLite three, as I as I've already explained several times. Uh, I use the SQLite three as a file format. Um, you know, this is actually a, a philosophy that SQLite itself sort of um, embraces. They, there's a whole document part in the docs about how to use like SQLite three is just your file your file format. So, you know, just like if you were having like a, like a note taking tool and you really love local data and local first apps, you would just use Markdown as your file format, right? You just have all of these local files. Um, I think there's this kind of weird, some people think like if it's not, if it's not a textual format that it's not true, like open local first apps. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think SQLite 3, it's a totally, it's just, a, it's not proprietary, right? It's completely open. Um, SQLite standardized, like everybody knows SQLite 3, um, but I, this is a better format to store the data. There's so many reasons why. Um, and so I, the way that I view it is like, this is just as open as if you had just a bunch of local files. Um, there's another app I think called Ledger that uses like standard text files and all these developers are like, this is great. I can, I can grep for my transactions. And it's like, it's off. Like that's off. It's awful. No, I'm, I, if you use that, it's so, it's totally fine. But I do think that like, there's this mentality there where it's like people li literally say it's a feature that they can um, like, that they have to build some hackery things on top of it. It's like fun. Totally fine if that's your thing. That is not going to be a, a close to any consumer focused, you know, product. Like, um, anyway, just a little bit of a rant. Um, so basically SQLite 3 is my, like, you can bring your own file around. And so you have your file. So actual uses SQLite file. Important thing to hear is this is all in your computer, right? So to me, this is just like you have a bunch of files on your computer. You have your SQLite file on your computer. If you really want, if you really wanted to, you could just like SQLite 3 into this file and do some select uh, queries. Um, so for example, you could totally do this. You could do select some amount from transactions where it, the date is between these two dates. It wouldn't be exactly this in actual, but you could literally do this. You could literally open up SQLite on your SQLite file and run this and get the balance uh, between those dates. Um, now, the, the updates, you shouldn't update your data because obviously updates is a very different problem. Uh, this needs to go through the CRDT and the whole syncing layer. So you cannot do this. Um, you cannot SQLite open. So this might be where it's like, Sure, it's not like totally like, you know, in Ledger, I'm sure you could open up your text file and actually change it. That's that, that's kind of like the 80%, right? Like I'm kind of cheating where it's just like, it's mostly local, like it's mostly this like pure open file, but it's not exactly because you can't update through it. You do have to update through actual syncing layer. Um, and the reason you need to do that is because of this syncing problem, right? And so it, I, I've seen, uh, like sure, you can update your ledger files, but like people use Git and then they have a Git conflict when it syncs, and it's just like again terrible, terrible user experience. You need to go and li literally like reconcile conflicts between 
your um between your ledger files that never happens in actual there's never a conflict right um so the, the thing that happens is you have these two different clients clients client a and client b um multiple changes are happening on each client when they're offline they haven't synced up yet and then at some point they sync right um and so this is why like updates are a very special case or not a special case they're just like it's a very different workflow than a select you could always select from the sql database because it's just like you're just reading the data but when you update it you have to go it's a very different workflow you have to make these changes in a way that other client we can tell other clients about them so you can't do this broad update query anymore you have to like only update specific uh specific items and actually do that in a way that we can sync them around to different clients um so you know how does that work so this is again i only go 80 percent of the way this is not a peer-to-peer -peer app there is a centralized server however uh the only reason why i have this um the server is so that you can close your laptop and then go to the grocery store and open up your app and it syncs all, and it syncs all your data. There's a, this is like fu fundamental problem with peer to peer, which is that like, uh, how do you get your data if everything else is offline, right? Other people have made changes and like you need to get the data somehow. Um, so I have a centralized server just begin so that I can meet users expectations about like I can provide backups, I can provide um, like real time sync so that you can do a bunch of data or like do a bunch of changes and then um, you know open up another client somewhere else in a totally different part of the world and they will get the changes. They don't have to actually peer to peer sync. There's a fun like fun fact around 2017, I actually did have peer to peer and the, the, the mobile app scanned a QR code from the desktop app and it got like how the info about how to connect each other um, and then it would like do that initial sync and then it would kind of set itself up, but it was awful. It was totally awful. Our infrastructure is awful. Like, again, I'm going to dip like at some point, somebody needs to, needs to solve that infrastructure layer. Like I would, I'd li literally get user reports where, where somebody was like, you know, I, like I scanned it, but it couldn't find my other computer. And I was like, well, were you at a public coffee shop? And they were like, yeah, I was at a public coffee shop. Turns out they like public coffee shop routers. They don't allow MDNS, the, the multicast. DNS. Our entire networking infrastructure is is shot. Like it's not it's not it's not built for this kind of stuff. So again, people smarter than me can solve that kind of stuff. It doesn't seem like there's a really super great solution for that right now. Um, maybe there is, and I don't know about it. But for me, the centralized server it's a it's it's fine. It covers at twenty percent of um, it provides it provides the convenience needed. So the, the server itself, though, it's important to know is that it's extremely small and naive, right? It only exists to assault it to avoid that P that P um, peer to peer complexity. Uh, it's basically just a message buffer. So, uh, you know, going back to this, like this syncing thing right here, what are we actually sending between clients? And um, what we're sending between clients is these things that, that I call um, messages. A message is just this like JavaScript object that has a timestamp, a table, a row, and a column, and a value, right? So if you think about a message, just to say like change this thing in this part of of the database, um, and so the server just collects all these messages and just puts them in like a buffer that other clients can read. That is, it's literally just like three hundred lines of JavaScript is my server. Um, I never have to worry about it going down. I never really have to worry about having any problems. Um, there's a whole account layer in the authentication part of the server, which is obviously a lot bigger. Uh, but this is what this is the fundamental building block of actual right here. Um, you can think of it sort of like a SQLite table is a spreadsheet, and these messages are just like mutating cells in that spreadsheet. And that's that's pretty much it. Um, so here's an example of like uh, a query literally from my um, my actual app, where uh, I there's a messages CRDT table uh, that I have, which stores all of these messages, and this is what's like change making these changes that says like this, uh, this table and this row in that table and this column at that table should have this value. And then there's this timestamp thing, which I'll go into in just a second that tells you like, that's actually what obviously tells us what order to apply these messages. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and that's it. That's basically what I do. And so there is, um, data in actual is duplicated twice. There's this messages CRD ta table. And then when they are applied, they're applied to all of the normalized uh, SQLite tables, right? That are the actual normal SQL tables, like transactions, pays, and rules. 
Um, and so there's data in both places. One is the CRDT form and one is the normalized form. And, and that's, it's just a, except like, that's just a cost that's acceptable to me. Um, I have five years of worth of data in actual, um, and I, I've, actually it's not duplicated because I've actually reset sync, which actually resets the sync data. But generally the databases are like five to 15 megabytes, right? We're, it's tiny. Like we're not talking about anything large here. Um, so again, so we have these like messages, which I hear, I, I call change. So there's a bunch of these changes. And what actual does is there's a whole syncing layer, which applies these changes. And so when you apply these changes, it's making these changes to the SQLite file, right? Um, and the, uh, the interesting thing, the really interesting thing here is that, um, is that uh, you could have like just a bucket of these changes, right? And you just can apply them through the system and as long as, uh, as long as everybody has seen the same messages, they will always get the same state. The order doesn't matter about the messages and the number of applications of those messages don't matter. So, so you could apply like the same message over and over and over again, right? Um, it turns out that this is like, uh, in this whole distributed world, this is a really, really powerful concept. And this, this basically is a CRDT. Um, and so as long as client A, B, and C have seen, have just seen all the messages, doesn't matter in what order they've seen them, doesn't matter when they've seen them, but as long as we can guarantee that they've seen the messages that you know that they have the same database, right? So what this is, is it's called a state-based CRDT. And so if you think about like a big blob of state, state-based CRDT and like making changes to that state, the state-based CRDT basically just like, um, it takes uh, chunks of state and then it like merges all of them together into one final state. And that's that's essentially it. There's another thing called operation-based CRDT, which to be honest, I'm not as, as familiar with, but I think it's a little bit more complex about how you can merge them because it's just not, not as straightforward. Um, now we need something to provide ordering, right? Because obviously I kind of I skimmed over the fact that I'm just applying all of these changes all the time. Well, to provide order into the system, you need a clock. And so I, um, I, don't, have a, I don't have time to go into this uh, right now. So I'm just gonna briefly mention that I use a hybrid logical clock. Um, it's a pretty interesting algorithm for providing ordering in a distributed um, system world. There's also like vector clocks. There's also a bunch of other types of clocks. Uh, the important thing is that you have a clock that gives uh, a total order into the system. And that's why you can like, it doesn't matter what, what order you've seen the messages, just like as long as you've seen the message, these clocks will get, will tell you whether you need to apply it or not. These clocks say, is this message newer than the current value that I have in the system? And if it is newer, then I then I make that mutation in, in the SQLite file, right? Um, so the, the HLCs provide like a nice trade-off and work well for me. Um, the other ones provide other trade-offs, but as long as you just use a clock to provide ordering, that, that's kind of the key ingredient that simplifies like all this kind of stuff. Um, another thing that I use is Merkle trees, which many of you are probably familiar with. Merkle trees guarantee consistency. And so Merkle trees, basically, they hash all of my timestamps. And so I can know immediately if two clients are the same, but just by comparing the root hash in a Merkle tree. If they're not the same, then they one of them has not seen messages that the other one has seen. Um, and they, they actually do more, more than provide consistency. Um, they also, uh, they, actually, they actually tell me which windows of time uh, are, um, are, are different between clients. And so for the server, I actually send the client's Merkle tree down. The server has its own Merkle. So the Merkle trees uh, exist per client. So every single client has like a SQL file with all of its messages and, um, and a clock and a Merkle tree. Um, the client sends down the Merkle tree to the server. The server has a clock in a Merkle tree as well for, the, for that client or for that like group. Um, and then it compares to Merkle trees and says, Okay, the client has not seen, there's something different in between this window. And then it sends back all of the messages to the client for that window. And then the client applies those messages, compares the Merkle trees again, and maybe there was a mutation somewhere, or like maybe there's a change um, while it was syncing, right? And so it could actually like, sometimes it has to loop a couple times in the syncing layer if the user is doing something really fast, because um, it will like see that, oh, the client's different, uh, something's different. And so it's the client ends up sending messages back to the server. And so there's this tree, the Merkle trees provide this really nice way to say, these are, this is the time window that needs to sync up, right? Um, and so, and, and at some point it'll, it'll get that consistent hash and say, okay, if that, if that hash is consistent, then I know the server and the client and all other clients, if that hash matches up, 
that they have exactly the same SQLite database. And it's really powerful is that I, I released this two years ago. Um, I, and I, I had, I, um, I have a, a log that actually logs when like, um, if it goes through the syncing layer a, a, a certain amount of times, like nine times, and the hash is still not the same. And in fact, I think I'd say like, if the, if the time window is the same and the hash is not the same for like nine times, that means there, there, there's something wrong. There's a bug in my syncing system, right? If the time window has, if you, if you reapply the messages for that time window and it's still not the same and you do that nine times, then like something's wrong. That's that's not a weird edge case for the user. Um, so I log that there's an out of sync inconsistency. Um, and so that was like the scariest error that I could get in actual, right? When I would see in Sentry, like the out of sync message, that means like, that's my problem. Like your data is corrupt and you have to reset sync. Um, and, but I haven't seen, um, I've done a couple of fixes, haven't seen it for like about six to seven months now. And when I was seeing it before, it was still pretty rare, uh, but I haven't seen it for a long time. So I have a pretty good, um, uh, confidence in my singular. layer. So overall, this is the general architecture. So we have the desktop, mobile, and web um, apps. So the desktop app uses Electron for the front end and the back end. Um, the mobile uses React Native for the front end. And then it uses a project called Node.js Mobile to actually run a Node back end on mobile. Uh, it's a pretty cool project. So it literally runs Node on the mobile device. Um, and these all use the, like these backends here are literally the same backend compiled into one JavaScript file. Um, and then the, the web, the web is an interesting one. Um, it uses obviously like a front end in the browser and the back end all runs in a worker um, and it uses SQLite JS. So it uses a, a, an M scripting compiled version of, of SQLite uh, which actually runs all in memory. And so it uses that all in memory. Um, it persists that to index DB every now and then. And then we, I also have like a queue of, um, of messages. Like I also store the latest like a thousand messages in index CB to persist it. And then as the app, there's just, there's a whole layer where the app boots up in the web where it applies messages because basically the problem with the web and SQLite JS is it's all, it's, it's all in memory. So you, so you could be making a couple of changes and then close and then close the tab and everything in memory just goes away and you lose your data, right? Obviously that's not acceptable. So in the syncing layer, there's a special part that applies it on the web in the same transaction that saves the messages to IndexDB. And so when you next boot up the app, it's, it loads any messages that are not applied from IndexDB and applies them into the system. And it's actually worked out pretty well. There's a couple of bugs there. So, so the web version is definitely the most experimental. Um, but the, the web version is actually the one that I'm most excited about. I have a whole lot of thoughts about like local apps and native apps now after going through all of this, because like, uh, I, it's, I, I don't have time to go into it, but like the web is so powerful um, because uh, asking somebody, first of all, asking somebody to install like a 70 megabyte, like download and install a 70 megabyte file on desktop is a huge, is a huge turning point there. Like people sign up and then they download and then they never actually end up running the app. If I could drop people right into a web, like a web app and like immediately show them how, how powerful this is. It's a huge, it's for like marketing purposes. That's like way more powerful. Uh, plus the fact that the browser, uh, we're in this really cool world where the browser, uh, prioritizes backwards incompatibility, right? So if you run this app, when, like when you start talking about local first apps, if you want to, to, to load an app and always know that it's going to run, right? The browser is, is, is the thing to do that. It's not local apps because Mac OS will switch to, uh, you know, the M1 chips and eventually the Intel apps are going to start working. And so if you had an Intel app, that was your local app, that's not supported anymore by any developer, but it's still running, uh, on then your native app is eventually going to start working. The browser is actually the only place that we can have true local first apps that will always run. Uh, forever because they prioritize backwards incompatibility. The problem is, is that the web sucks, right? And uh, they actually do not embrace local apps at all. IndexDB sucks. Like the the backwards incompatibility, the the backwards incompatibility incompatibility can't speak. Part of the web is amazing. The tech is unfortunate. Desktop wise, the tech is awesome, but the backwards incompatibility story kind of sucks. And like the deployment and the marketing story sucks. So we're sort of in between a rock and a hard place right now. I don't really know what the solution or what the way forward is. So um, I wasn't gonna spend time talk, talking about that actually. So I'm gonna move forward. Um, 
So the things that, so these errors, these arrows here between the server and the clients, these are just the messages being sent back and forth, right? So again, the server is just like a message buffer that stores these messages and the clients can read them and get, and get them back and forth. Um, okay, so, you know, don't have a ton of time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about like, so we have this thing that just like mutates cells in a uh, SQLite table. So how, how do we enforce correctness, right? Obviously I have some structure of data that requires some sort of correctness, right? It's not like my data uh, is just a spreadsheet. Like there, there's some other data structures that I have like a tree that I need some sort of correctness um, there. So let's, let's say that you had a tree that, and the constraint was that it should only ever have two children, right? So here we have a tree where the root is A and then it has a children of a B and C. Let's say that you implemented the children as a set. So we say new set B and C. Um, well, let's say that you to 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 set the child of a um, of a node, you would say you know um, set C as a child of A. And the problem with this is that if you have uh, let's say that you have a tree node A that has one child B, um, if two different clients go offline before they sync, and they each say something like set C as a child of A. And then another, the, the other client says set D as a child of A, each of these clients are gonna say, okay, A only has one child. I can totally set this as a child of A. It's totally fine, right? The problem with this is that when they sync up, this is gonna be the resulting state. You have an invalid data structure here where you have three children under this node. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is where you get into like what I was talking about at the very beginning where um, there are CR CRDTs that will enforce correctness at this layer, right? We're in the CRDT. They will make sure that whatever the, the the constraints that you have, you're modeling your data in a way that it it you know it's always 100% correct. It's a CRDT, and so it's syncable and it's distributed, but it's also built in a way where it's always correct. And that's that's a whole different like there's a whole you know area of research and and all these kind of things. So here it's a simple solution. You could just say, okay, I'm not going to model my 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 data as a set. I'm going to model it as the a node has an ID of a, and then it just has two child one and child two properties, right? So no matter how the messages are applied, there's always only gonna be two children. Now you might not know like what the, what the resulting state is, but you're changing your, your, your data model so that you are enforcing your consistency. And so in actual, this is again, going back to the like, I kind of only go 80% of the way. Um, there are certain places in my database schema that just have to be correct. If it were incorrect, I would have to do so much work in the, in the front end and so much work above the database to make to like make up for that lack of correctness that it would just not it would just be terrible. Uh, so there are some things where I've I've done some pretty complex data modeling to make sure that as the messages are synced forward that everything goes through um, like a proper um, like when I get when I read read the data from from the database that I, I know that it's correct in a certain way. I, I don't have time to go into like more details. There's, there's some interesting problems here though. Um, there's a lot of things that are just like really hard to, to, to model at the database layer. Like you can't have constraints anymore. You can't have like a not null constraint in your SQLite, right? Because these messages, you could only, um, even though you generate a bunch of messages to fill out an object, you might only get half those messages. If like the network goes down or something goes weird, you have it in this world, you have to assume that you can only get two out of those five messages. And so even though um, it will it will set the like transfer ID of a transaction, you might get messages that create the transaction without a transfer ID. Like that you just, you have to accept that in this, in this world. And so um, I have a lot of additional checks at the read layer. I actually use SQLite views um, that filter out like partial objects, right? And so this is sort of the like, I kind of cheat where um, I don't, I don't model my idea. I, I do allow some invalid um, constraints, um, but then at the read layer, I do a bunch of checks and I do a bunch of stuff to sort of make up for the fact that I'm not using really proper, proper CRDTs in some ways. Uh, but for this, this has really worked out for me. Um, and so this really enables a lot of cool features. Um, I mean, I'll pause for a second. Are there, are there any questions I see? see a chat um cool uh let's you're, see. you're on a roll keep going okay i lost my cursor how do i close the chat okay there you go all right so um so features so let's talk about like this is the thing that i really want to talk about it's just like the things that this enables um and you know first of all it's just fast 
right? Like all of your data is local. You're not dependent on the network layer at all. Um, it, it, to me, it kind of goes contrary to this idea, like to be fast, you have to be in the cloud because then you're, you're running on this like massively large ES2 or um, EC2 instance. And so uh, you accept the, the whatever, five to 20 milliseconds cost of the network. And then like it goes off to this cloud, does this extremely powerful thing and comes back and the client, like it can always be fast. The problem is like everybody, everybody is on Wi-Fi and cell these days and Wi-Fi and cells suck. Like I'm up here in my office, the Wi-Fi router is literally, I think right under my, my, this, um, this floor. And it's great. Like 80% of the time, I don't know what happens in that 20% of the time, a car drives by or something. And my, my latency goes through the roof. And so every single app that I use that depends on the cloud. I mean, Notion is a great example of this. Like they're getting, they're getting a lot of slack, um, flack right now about how slow Notion is. Cause whenever you click a page, you just see a spinner for like two seconds and it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, performance really is a feature. It's a really powerful convincing selling feature for people, even though they might not say they would use an app because it's faster. Once they actually feel that it's actually a really powerful selling point. So the entire app is consistently fast because it's literally never hitting the network except just to sync. Every time you do an action, it's always just purely local. You can also do end-to-end -end encryption. So again, I do not think this is a, a, a selling point for the mainstream, but I think this is a, to me, it's a way um, of proving to the user that I'm not, I don't need your data to survive, like that I'm, I'm not actually reading your data. Um, cause end-to-end -end encryption is actually off by default because of like performance reasons and just like UX reasons. It's a little like what happens if you lo lose your key, lose your password. Um, I want the user to opt into that sort of experience. Um, so it's not opt on, it's, it's not on by default. Um, but again, to me, this is just like, it's a way to build trust to the user and it's just a super cool feature. Um, so the way it works obviously is these messages that I've sending around. Uh, well, it just encrypt them before they leave the client. And then uh, all the clients have to have the same key. And then when the client reads the message, it just decrypts it. So um, on the server, this is like a terrible screenshot, but this is what it looks like on the server. Um, it's actually stored in binary on the server. And so you see this, there, there's an is encrypted field that tells, that helps the client know whether it should decrypt it or not. Um, and then this, the content of each message is actually just this little binary blob. And I use protobuf to, uh, to actually move, like to actually serialize the messages into a binary blob. That is, that's the thing that's actually synced around. That's like when, whenever a client sends a message, it, all, it, it actually uses protobuf to serialize into this binary blob. If encryption is enabled, it will encrypt that before it sends it off. So everything is always encrypted. Um, now here's, here's another thing where that like 20% where I cheat. Um, for the, for all apps, the local data itself is not encrypted because I personally believe that if you're on desktop, you should probably use a, a file system an entire file system that just encrypts everything automatically for you. Um, that should be at the platform layer, um, on, on mobile. I, that's just kind of a different story. I don't know, like iOS sandboxing is so good. Like you don't really need to encrypt your files there, uh, for the web and kind of same for the web, not much can, is going to be able to read your index to be, um, the benefit of not encrypting it locally, again, is just UX. So if somebody forgets their key, they can actually just like create a new key and then they, it re-encrypts everything and re-uploads it to my server. Um, and it's totally fine. You forget your key. I say, hey, do you have a local copy? Most people do. And then they just reset the key. Um, and I don't ever need to know about like the, the, there's, there's nothing, um, there's nothing that breaks the encryption there. Like I'm never getting your um, not encrypted data. And so that, again, that's sort of, sort of a stopgap. It feels a little bit weird for the server to store things differently, um, but it's kind of worked out well in practice. Um, another feature that I recently thought, and I'm gonna do a quick demo for this one as well, um, if I go back into here. So um, um, we can actually build a time machine. So I'm gonna go into here and I'm gonna enable uh, this timeline. So super ugly, but um, if I enable this timeline, this is something that I hacked up that just, it shows the entire history of the system. So these are just reading all of the messages from this URDT, right? And so I can say, Hey, around this time, I deleted eight transactions. I updated the expression of a bunch of spreadsheets and I deleted eight categories. Uh, obviously this is pretty hacky. This is not, not the best, but you can get the idea here that you can see this, like this timeline of events that happened. And now what's really cool is, um, 
right now I have this backup system where you can load a backup again, totally, totally a local file. So to create a backup, what do I do? I just copy that file to somewhere else. So these are the backups, but um, I'm imagining revamping this backup system to where um, I have this timeline. If I keep one backup, which is the database at the beginning state point in time, right? Like right here, the, the database that would have been at this point in time, I could create a time machine that is exactly the same as like Mac OS's time machine experience, which uh, the entire app sort of like fades into the background. It is like space theme. And I think Mac OS actually ditch the whole like the actual space um experience which is pretty unfortunate in 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 older versions of mac os if you enter time machine it actually like warped you into space and like yeah there's like this like aura of like uh, all these stars and all this magical experience now it just goes, shows your background um but i'm, I'm thinking of re re-implementing that where you go into the time machine and you can click any of these points in time and it will reload the app at that point in time because it will load that old version of the database and then replay all of the messages up to that point in time. And so this is essentially the undo that could work on any client, right? Where, oh shoot, like I restarted the app, so I lost my undo state. Well, you can go into this like superpower undo mode, time machine mode, and actually travel through time. Um, haven't, implement, haven't done this yet, but it's to totally doable. Um, so another feature, uh, and this is another one, this is one of the reasons why I started Actual, is that I have my query language called Actual QL. So it kind of looks like this, just actually just released this in the last version. Um, it's sort of a Mongo-ish syntax where you can quickly query your data. So again, all, all of your data is local, right? And so I'm just gonna like allow you to query it yourself. And so you could imagine that custom reports end up being this like editor where you can write your own queries and then it just shows you the graph under it. So sort of going back into the spreadsheet roots, right? Where um, this is the part that's like, I'm still, still working through. I don't really love that there's like two separate sections. It might just be like one big editor and then it shows you the results in line. Um, but again, this is, all your data is local. So you can just like run SQL queries. I mean, it doesn't even have to be actual QL here. You could just run a SQL query yourself, um, like raw. Um, and because all your data is local. Um, you could do this in the cloud, but it's just, it's way, way harder. And it's way more sensitive because you're gonna be running these SQL queries against a database with other people's data. So you gotta be really, really sure that your security is tight there. And I don't think that most people are really gonna go down that path. For me, it's just like, sure, if you wanna run a SQL injection on yourself, sure. Um, so again, uh, sort of uh, re, re iterating the same point, but um, we have just a local SQLite file. So if you're a developer, you can just like drop into that with SQLite 3 and run a bunch of select transactions yourself. Um, so this is going back to the, like what I talked about, it's closed, it's closed source and it requires a subscription. Something that I'm considering that I might do that might just be good for like upselling um, and just providing a good, a good, like a cool tool. I could totally provide like a free CLI version, which like the entire app is bundled into a node package. Um, and you can like NPM install that. And then you have, you, you, you manage all your data straight through the CLI, like just in your terminal. Um, and that could be a completely free, completely local app. that will always work as long as node runs, um, actual could die off and die away, but you will still have the CLI version that is not tied to the authentication layer at all. So this could be a way that's like sort of giving homage to the fact that this is a local first app, that it is, a, that it truly could, could work that way if we figured out the sustainability problem, um, something that I'm sort of playing with. This would not be that hard to do, especially with libraries right now that make it so easy to write CLIs. Um, not sure, but um, so I wanna talk a little, like I know, I'm, I know I'm running a little bit out of time. There are a bunch of UX difficulties though. Um, one thing that I wanna show right here really fast, let me turn off this timeline, um, is, is backup. So, this file is synced all around, right? So this file is syncing with this other one right here. Uh, if I load a backup, what happens now when I load this backup, right? Well, it's kind of weird. I've reset this, like I've moved, I've loaded a backup, which is a completely different file. So now what happens to all the other clients? Like now there's this weird mismatch of like, they, they can't sync anymore, right? The syncing between them has, the, has been broken because I've, I'm replacing the file for this file with a different one. 
And so I have this whole system that checks the syncing status of a file. And so here it actually saw that you re like syncing has been reset on this file. You've loaded a different file. You're on a different timeline now. So you are out of sync with the, with the existing group. Um, so what you can do is you can revert this file, um, which will, if, if I just loaded a backup, what this is going to do is revert it back to my version in the cloud. So it's going to just like, like dump the backup, or I can upload this file and I'm going to force this backup to become the canonical version of my file. Right. And so now, now this is the canonical version. Well, now what happens to this version? This is the old version. Well, this says, oh, there's a syncing error. Syncing has been reset on this cloud file. So now I need to revert this one. And now my, my backup is sort of propagating through all the clients as the as, as, as the true file. This is just like one example of a, of a, of a workflow. It's a whole lot of complex workflows here that this is, this is why it's taken so long to build the, to build the foundations of this app, because it's a whole different model. And it's just taken a long time to sort of re like realize all these complexities. And it's, it's the same thing with encryption, right? So I, I can go into here um, and in, um, enable encryption. Here's my, here's my password. Cool. So I encrypted the data. Well, now I need to go into here. Well, encrypting your data um, always, res always resets the sync, right? Because again, it's a new file that's encrypted now. So it's a different file. It's, it's on a different timeline. So I, I need to revert this file. Oh, but now it's saying, well, the file is, is encrypted. And so now I need to enter the password to decrypt this file. And now everything is back up in sync and it's all now it's encrypted. Now, if I open this file right here, you can see, I think it's this one. There's this little key right here that says it's encrypted. So very, very hard to get all this UX right. And I think it's critical that we get the UX for these kind of things correct, because otherwise it's just super confusing for the user. Um, there are some downsides. I don't really have a ton of time to talk about. Schema changes are very difficult, right? That is like the very obvious problem here is that like now the schema changes are the, because the schema exists on a bunch of different um, files, a bunch of, like a bunch of different devices, I can't just go in and, and rename a field. And there's a lot of work being done by the Ink and Switch group with Project Cambria and, and other things that are using things like lenses to, to, to make this kind of thing easier. Uh, but it's, it's still a difficult problem. Uh, you're also fighting against the world. So I really want to release the, the feature of bank syncing, but now it's like nobody in the bank syncing world has this idea of end-to-end end, end to end encryption, right? They always just assume it goes through your cloud provider. So it's like, doesn't that kind of kill like my privacy aspect? I've come to I've I've come to the conclusion that it does not at all, and it's more about choice. Like the user can link their account if they want to, and that is their choice to opt into less privacy and opt into more more convenience. And so they can maybe do that for one account, but not do that for the rest of their accounts. And so there's gradient here where I'm still giving the user the choice for how like how private they want their data to be. If they want to just import their files and always manually add transactions, that will always be a supported workflow in actual. Um, and so, you know, I've been talking to some startups that are doing bank syncing and I was like, can, can, can you like work with the user, get a key from them, encrypt the data and give that encrypted data to me. And then I'll give that encrypted data to them that they can decrypt. And like, no, nobody's interested in that. Nobody's interested in that. Um, almost every feature is harder. I'm just going to say it. Almost every feature is harder. So I, a user came to me last week and said, you know, your, your pay renaming system could greatly be improved by a simple first approximation of an, with an ML model. Um, and I was like, I have no idea what you just said. Can I like, so I, I met with him and talked about it and it sort of blew my mind. I was like, man, there is this whole world out there of ML models. There's like a TensorFlow JS library that um, I'm looking into and just realizing all the cool things I can do with that. I think about that now, but like uh, now I have this weird thing where uh, the ML model is, is going to exist locally, of course. So every single client is going to have this ML mo model. As it learns, what the heck does that mean for it learning on different clients? And I need to somehow sync, sync the learning behavior across them, right? So everything that I use, I have to think about it in now this way where I, it needs to be syncable across devices, whereas everybody else can just go and use the same ML model on the server. And they just don't even have to think about this kind of problems. Uh, scheduled transactions, it's... The reason why it's hard is because if you schedule a transaction to be added on May the 5th and two clients go offline and on May the 5th, they open the app, it's going to add a transaction on May the 5th and then it's going to sync up and there's going to be two transactions on May the 5th that are duplicate, right? So a simple thing like schedule transactions ends up being a little bit more difficult because you have to think about like, well, no, I don't want that UX of two transactions being added on the same date. 
Um, saving receipts. If you want to take a picture of your receipt and upload it to to somewhere, how does that work now, right? Do I, if you have encryption enabled, I need to like encrypt that image. Do I store it in S3 or do I store it locally? But if I store it locally, when you download the app initially on, on a new device, you're gonna have to download all your images if it's stored in SQLite. So it's somehow it needs to be linked out. It just, it, it does make everything kind of harder. I personally still think it's worth it. Um, and uh, I think the trade-offs are worth it, especially for um, these reports. This is the thing that I'm really actually the most um, psyched about. I think there's, this is a very simple screenshot I did, in, I, I did in like two minutes. I have a whole range of ideas here that I could do with, cust with um, custom reports where people could build these reports and they can share them with everybody else. So you don't have to necessarily write code, right? You could just like import reports. Pretty, it's, it's, pre it's pretty much the spreadsheets, but fixed. So that is all of my thoughts so far uh, on actual. Thank you for listening. Amazing, a round of jazz hands. Uh, that was fantastic, James. It's uh, it's really a great pleasure to to really have you go through that in a way that 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 explains your vision. Uh, I know the vision team in the background is like, I think we can do that part. Oh, that's amazing. We should talk about how to do that, um, even just conceptually. So that last part that you ended with in in talking about like, oh, what if people can share models? We're thinking a lot about how people who aren't programmers can personalize and customize and then form their own community around things. And I think your, your free CLI tool also heads in that direction. You don't necessarily want a competitive front end, but maybe you do because it just grows the number of people who are in the ecosystem, right? Some really, really interesting things that you even just hinted at. So uh, thank you, that was great. No problem. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, if you have any ideas of ways that I could improve that or would, would solve these problems that I talked about. I would love to hear them. Uh, we've got a few people. So Osama is talking about uh, federated learning uh, and, uh, and has uh, a linked uh, Twitter account. Um, you know, I think uh, we look at platforms like Apple who are doing some of this stuff locally. Um, um, so directionally it's there. It's uh, the question always is you've always, you've put, a bunch of dark magic into one app. How many other domains are you going to uh, have to consume versus having someone else giving you a component that you can use? <laughs> uh, but that's a that's part of being ahead of the market, I think. Yes. Uh, questions. <laughs> Wait. We're always happy to see cats in the call. Go ahead, Jerry. Yes, uh, uh, I'm very interested in that Node.js mobile. If you could give me a little more details, how big it is, how difficult to work, can you, how, how do you load your own own mobile app, mobile node app into it? If you give me some details, I would be very interested. Sure, so uh, Node.js mobile, it's a little bit of a funny I th background. Um, at first, it used uh, Chakra. I th like I think it was first supported by Microsoft, and Microsoft replaced the JavaScript engine in Node with their own. Uh, Chakra is uh, Internet or like Edge's um, JavaScript, JavaScript implementation, and they did that for various reasons because Chakra is easier to get running running on mobile. Um, I think they've split. I think they've changed that now to where it does use V8 on Safari and it uses Chakra on Android just to get because V8 is V8 is obviously already available. Um, but it's essentially like they. It's essentially what you think it is. Like they have taken Node and they have gotten it to compile on ARM and they've gotten it to compile against and they they've they've built up the infrastructure and tooling and APIs so that if you're using React Native you can literally import. Um, there's like a CLI that you say like init Node.js mobile React Native app, and it boots it all up for you, gets it all installed into your Xcode project and Android project. Um, and then you give it an entry point. You're like a, like a main.js file. And when you spawn off that process, it's, it runs in a different process. It runs, no, it's fires, it starts your entry point and it's literally Node compiled for ARM. So, but is there any way of packaging it up into an APK so I can just ship uh, with my code in it? Is that possible? Um, if so, yeah, they, they have like infrastructure for for um, 
linking it and bundling it for iOS and, and, and Android. So if you're just using like native iOS and Swift, there's like a Swift package that you use that connects it all together and hooks it up and runs it. And then you, you compile it all together into one single bundle and you submit it to the app store and that's your app and it runs Node.js in the background in, in like a background process. And the same for Android, is that mm -hmm. and Android? Yeah. Yep, okay. Android and, and, and uh, iOS. That's, that's the idea. They, they, they made it for local first apps, basically. Well, that, that's actually quite amazing, yeah. It is very amazing, yeah. I'm slightly concerned about the maintainability of it. I, I don't think it's super actively worked on, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that's not gonna be a problem in the future. How much, <laughs> what, how much space does that require in your, in your app? Oh, that's a good question. So I like the app size itself, I think it adds like seven to 10 megabytes to that app. Oh. So it's not the best, but it's also not the worst. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, not it's fine. It's fine. It's right. great. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. That's a very useful thing. Uh, one other little comment. I mean, many of the issues you talked about in terms of your, uh, your, your, uh, your get, get, getting the hashes and all that. You're really doing some of what IPFS is doing, effectively. Yep, I'm not surprised. By hand, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of uh, yeah. Okay. But, wait, uh, did you wait? Did you say I, IPFS or interplanetary fast? You know, the yep. protocol, the, yep. the one that Fission builds on. You know, uh, yes, it's exactly that. That that you you know in drive you basically have all that. Mer so Merkle tree, like, yeah, I think you're mainly talking about like Merkle trees and things like that. That's, yes, yes, yeah, yes. I mean, Merkle trees is used like everywhere in like blockchains and distributed systems and like, yeah, because it's a super, it's a super, super um, helpful, helpful concept. The problem with like, I just, I, I, so I started this a couple of years ago. I think it might be a little bit better now, but uh, I, I don't even know if it would be better now, but there's just, there's nothing out there that really solves, like it solves half the use cases, but it's like hard to embed on React Native and it's just hard. So I, I went my own path just because like it's done, I, I, I can do it now. And um, I, I would yeah. love for, I would love for more more libraries and, and, and things to be available for people to just package things up. But there's also just like performance characteristics. Like a lot of things are just slow because when they sync up all the changes, so, some things even like require you to, when they boot up the app, there's not a snapshot. So what it literally does is it downloads all of the messages and then applies them through in the database on literally when the client like logs in and that's just unacceptable to me. Um, so I, I have a look, I have a recent snapshot of the database that it downloads and then it syncs up like the last couple of days of messages. And so, yeah, there, there's just a lot of things like that, that the, 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 the uh, distributed world just isn't, it's not quite there yet. Uh, question from Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, do you want to just read it or do you want me to read it out? Sure, I can read it. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, what do you do for schema changes? So like, if I'm running actual v 0.0.1 on my desktop, and I make a change, do you just need to be able to, does every client need to be able to read and apply that change for all future versions of actual? Yep, it's a good question. I So I only, I do not actually worry, well, I worry some, but um, if I, it, if it crosses a threshold of like complexity, I will just break backwards compatibility, especially especially this early on in the app where it's just like, I am not willing to live with, because uh, I, I think things like lenses and um, figuring out how to like map data across different clients, they are great, but they, are, they can also be a big te technical liability where I should not have to live with this additional lens uh, and this cost uh, for the rest of the life of the app, because I made this stupid decision when I first built the app, and so um, for basically for now, note the um, the generally speaking, I um, I'm trying to think about how, how to word this. I, I when I make schema changes, um, I most of the time I can make it so that it can read old messages. So it actually it's um, like it's forward compatible. But the old client, if if there's if I make something or like I like let, let's say that I implement a new feature and I create a new table, right? I can always read all the old messages because those are always only going to come in to the to all the other tables that I know already exists. But if I create that new table and the new this new version of the app is starting to create messages for that new table, the old app, I I don't worry about that at all. Like there, there's just no way around it. It doesn't make any sense for the old app to receive those messages. And so the old app, there's a there's a workflow that detects like 
hey, I can't apply this message. Uh, there's probably an upgrade to the app. Can you go check that if there's an upgrade and you probably need to upgrade the app and it forces everybody to upgrade the app. And so I, I don't worry about that case. I do worry a lot about um, when I upgrade that I should be able to read um, read, read, other, read, read messages from, from old versions of clients. Cause if I can't do that, um, and there's been like maybe a couple of times when I've done this, if I can't do that, then I have to, I force the user to, to, to do a sync, a sync reset, which means on all the devices, they, they, they have to sync reset because I, I can't reliably take messages from the old version. So when you upgrade and then you're at that point, I tell the user, Hey, here's a button, here's a button to do a sync reset because you're not going to be compatible with the old version. And it's, I don't know, like that, that's, that's, that's the 20% of, of, of cheating that I've done to avoid having to do like a complex lens system. Um, I think, yeah, Thank I, you, mean, I need to go. Sorry. sorry. Thanks Jerry. Yeah. Bye. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff is not cheating. It's pragmatism also of being a single individual and really thinking about what the UX trade-offs are um, and you know, do you explain stuff to the user or you just go like, you know what, computers are weird. You need to hit this reset button. Yep. Um, which will be scary for some of them, but then if they hit the reset button and everything keeps working, the like, great <laughs> ceremony yeah, I, ritual. Yep. <laughs> I, I've, I've never had a complaint about it, to be honest. And I'm a little surprised at that. Like I've never seems like everybody's just like whatever, whatever. Sure, I mean, it's, so it's kind of like does man. This even work at all? Uh, you're yeah. connecting to banks and it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, question for you, actually, on the web, do you um, do you sh do you do caching or anything like that, where you're like showing a, um, hey, this web version is stale. Please hard refresh the browser. I don't right now. So it actually doesn't need, does not even use a service worker. So that that's where the web version is still a little bit experimental. Um, it, uh, so whenever you refresh the, the page, it actually just always gets the latest version, which is, is not great. Like this, I really need to solve. Um, I, I really need to look into service workers and learn them because that's an obvious next step. Um, but yet when, when I do service workers and it always runs in its own little thing, uh, I will have to do this like, Hey, there's an upgrade available and you need to push this button to do an upgrade. We're we're, we're struggling with that right now ourselves in like in practice, basically in reality where, Hey, it's broken. No, you just haven't hard refreshed the like entire thing. Oh, it works again now. Oh, okay. We really do need on the server to have this local first thing go, Hey, browsers are weird. Please mash a refresh button. And even there, like, you know, it's really hard to, um, really, really nuke state from the browser in a way that's explainable to users. So, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because to me, it's just kind of like, I'm actually super used to that because it's the exact same problem if you're running an old client desktop app and yes, you, and you're getting the changes from a newer version. I have a whole workflow that says, uh, there's probably an upgrade you need to go upgrade. And so I think the web version is going to go through the exact same workflow as the old client desktop. Yeah. So for me, it, yeah, I guess I already have built that workflow, which um, it is like, it is weird though. I, I think what it is, is it's, it's so um, it's the expectations of users when they're sitting in a browser, right? We're building these local first apps that are in the same frame that they look at non-edible pages where they're reading a blog post on Wired and they have a janky SaaS app that kind of works where they don't have access to any of their data. And we don't have a new frame other than I'd say, have you actually made actual budget a uh, PWA so that it? I no, I, I have not done that yet. Okay, and th these are the sorts that like making it a PWA honestly is a manifest file, and then it like it all tabs on macOS. Like, it's, um, I, I wish it actually did more. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions that folks have? Uh, Ricardo, uh, is there currently, or will there be a way in the future to remotely interact with the app? I guess you mean APIs, Ricardo? Hey, yes, sorry. Uh, I was trying to unmute, unmute myself. Yeah, I know I'm actually, hey, James, uh, nice to put a face on, uh, on the developer. I'm, I'm actually hey. a customer of yours. Oh, so amazing. I, I, I've been using the app for quite some time and I'm really impressed and I really love it. So one of the, I've been uh, using the, the API to kind of like 
build like custom reports for myself, you know, every once in a while, like once a month to figure out how much I need to pay or whatever on a given, uh, on a given card. So the API has been really, really great and useful. The only downside that I've had so far is that I had to, you know, you know, boot up the app, uh, run my Node.js script to get the, the data from it. And then I have the, the, the numbers, right? Which now it's, it's, it's better with the filtering mecha mechanism that you built recently. So one, one of the things um, that, you know, I'd be, um, I've been trying to, to figure out a way to do is how could I, um, let's say I, I like to schedule that, uh, you know, I like to automate it, you know, so that's kind of why I was asking this question, like, is there a way, you know, I could have some sort of worker in a server doing that job for me and then just sending me a message, a text message of, hey, you know, your due date is now and it's today and th this is how much you need to pay. Yeah, so the, 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 it actually has an API for some context. It's a little weird right now because um, what it j does is it actually just connects to a local running actual instance. Um, like it, because the front end and the back end in Electron actually go through a, um, what's it called? A, a Unix domain socket, like in, there's a special file somewhere. Um, so the API actually just like taps that socket and just sends messages to the local running instance, which is, it's kind of a fun hack. Cause like, as you're making changes to the API, the app actually, like if you add a trans transaction to the, through the API, you actually see the app, like the transaction comes in. Um, but it is a little bit weird because you have to run actual first. And so like, if you're not running actual, it says you, hey, you need to run actual to connect to it. Um, yes, I, I've thought about this for a while. I just haven't had time to re really think it through. Um, the, the, like this is kind of the funny thing about local first apps is like, it forces all of your code to be available. I mean, even though it's obfuscated and minified, like this is, goes back to the sustainability problem. It's just like, you know, theoretically you probably could hack it, things in there and just like run the app without paying. Probably shouldn't say that, but um, the for a while, it's just like, I, I kind of avoided the, the idea, but basically the, the API needs to have the bundled backend in the bundled app like as part of the package. And that's what would enable it to run seamlessly without having to connect to the local client. And it, it, it would become another client, right? So now this, and that goes back to my idea of the free CLI app. Like that is essentially, that, that is essentially the, the, um, the thing where I might just accept that, like, I'm going to put this, I'm going to give this away for free. Um, and that the value that I have is bank syncing the, the front end, the whole front end client, the mobile app. I think that all of that is enough value to convince people to upsell. I'm not really that worried about it. So yes, I think um, at some point the API will actually bundle the entire backend as part of it, and it will not it will not connect to actual. And uh, I'll need to figure out the authentication there because you'll need to like, you know, to connect to the server uh, to make any changes that other clients see. You need to like authenticate, create like an API token or something. Um, and that, I don't know, like, I feel like that should expire after a certain time, but there's some security ramifications there. Um, but yes, eventually that will come. I need to just sort of figure out that authentication part. Uh, but eventually the API will be able to be its own like standalone client that can do whatever it wants to, to its local data. Um, and then if it wants to make changes, it can, and it can sync those changes back to the server and it would work exactly the same with, um, exactly the same way that a client does. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I know we're getting very close to time. So uh, actually, uh, I, I want to ask one more question, which is, have you considered, uh, you know, a lot of talking about the like obfuscating and free bits and sustainability. Uh, have you considered something like a non-commercial license where people uh, could um, use various bits of it if they weren't making money off of it, but if other people built stuff that earned money, they'd need to buy a license from you? I haven't really, I haven't considered it because, um, I mean, are you talking about building like a different actual client or are you talking about the libraries? Who, who knows yeah. what people would do with it, right? Like that's that's the thing once you make it open, right? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I haven't considered it too much. I mean, I'm more focused on, um, this could change, but I, I think that I was wanting to build a, like actual as, as an app is really actual as a platform and like those custom reports really becomes the thing like you should not have to go off and build i know people want to do that i know it's and i know it's cool i know that you can empower a community like a community 
Um, but again, I can, I think I can get most of the way there and it's actually, the UX is a lot slicker. Um, if you can just do that right in the app, um, yeah. and the app itself becomes this, like, so I've been thinking of this thing where like, seriously, the app, um, the app, I, I still love this idea where at the root of it, it's just this spreadsheet that you can go in and control. So it's less configurable than I, uh, um, originally envisioned, but there's things like, um, that actual QL, actual QL query system. Every single number you see in actual is generated by an actual QL query, which I can get and format and display to you. And so um, in actual, the app, what I want to do at some point is you hold like a special key, like function eight or something. And wherever you hover over a number, a, a tool tip pops up and it actually shows you the query that actually generated that, that number. Um, and that really gives you this like deep insight. And then I can also allow you allow like reports to like hook into various parts where in the budget, the top of the budget for that budget month, you could actually pull in part of your custom reports as well. So there, there's, I, I, that's, that's where I'm going instead of, instead of going the like open source, like route where people build things on top of it, I want to build it as a platform and that's where I'm going yeah. right now. So em empowered on programmers. Yeah. Another question was like, are you going to open source the sync engine? I, it's again, it's not generalizable. It's so, vertically integrated. it's, it's yeah. so vertically integrated. I just, I mean, I'm happy. Like I, I gave a talk about a year and a half ago at .js. There is, um, maybe I should post that really fast. Um, I, I did, I did show, I implemented the, the basic concepts in a demo. Um, and let me see if I can get, yes, yeah, right here. So this is, this is basically all of the concepts. I'll, I'll paste it in the chat. It is missing a lot of the like sort of edge casey stuff. Um, but I think you can, um, learn, I, I'm happy to like, just teach people and teach people the concepts and, and I'll tell you exactly how it works, but I'm not going to open source the code because just open sourcing stuff, just it, I don't have time for that. That's so, and it doesn't honestly, it just doesn't benefit actual enough to, to, to invest that time into it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, let's do one more round of jazz hands. That was amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I am going to stop recording now.